but the site was wedge shaped. So we started by first creating a wedge and by doing this, you increase the face on the northern side. These are other angles of the building. So again, because of the way the building is twisted on its side, the building is never perceived the same way from any direction. So every time you look at this building, whether you're on the left or the right or the north or the south, you get a different dimension of the building. So when we looked at the program and the kind of building that they wanted to make, all the requirements necessitated an area of 400,000 square feet. That 400,000 square feet, when you translate into a clean cut block, just to see, just to study how much is the built volume, how much is the landscape volume. The very renowned ladies and gentlemen, Sanjay Puri of Sanjay Puri Architects. Can we have a huge, huge round of applause? So today's presentation is about spaces that are polyvalent. What are polyvalent spaces? These are the spaces that one gets to use in multiple different ways at different times. And these are the spaces that actually give the character to your buildings, to the kind of uh, architecture that you do. Because everybody knows that you can take the functional aspects of any project, put them together in a box, and it's a tight box. But when you open it up and you create these polyvalent spaces, the courtyard, the extension spaces, the spaces which foster social interaction, these are what makes the architecture live and breathe in the true sense. So this is Charles Courier's sketch from his book, the one on top where he's very nicely described it as uh, the courtyard, which is the inner space within a house or within a small school. And then the space at your threshold, the doorstep, the community spaces, and the spaces that are extensions, which are used extensively by people. In Indian architecture, the courtyard was the beginning of the polyvalent spaces. And that can be seen in traditional Indian architecture right down the centuries from very small scales in houses to very large scale like Fatehpur Sikri and uh, the other traditional major works. Now this is the courtyard office. So it's a take on the courtyard, but it's not a direct take. So you imbibe a certain, the essence of the courtyard, but you've twisted it and transformed it in a different way. So I'll take you through some examples where in each case, the courtyard has been transformed differently to suit that particular project, that particular client, those particular functions, and that particular site in that location. So this was a site in a small place, which is near Baloda Bazaar, which is two hours drive from Raipur. And we started with this. The client wanted a simple office which is ground plus one and all their functional requirements fit well in a ground plus one structure because there was ample land within the site which is rare in most Indian cases but the site was wedge shaped so we started by first creating a wedge and by doing this you increase the face on the northern side and the heat in Raipur as is most of India, from the central India to the south India, the temperatures are in excess of 35 degrees Celsius for eight months of the year. And then we further twisted it. So by that twist, you see that the north facade has now grown even bigger. And the courtyard has been given an interesting shape where in each part of the office, when you look out to the courtyard, you see a different dimension. If it's a pure square, you will see that courtyard in the same way, whether you're on the left or the right or the back or the front. In this case, you know that you are in this part because you're seeing a certain aspect of it. And then what you've done is, unlike a traditional courtyard space, where it's simply punctuated in the middle of a building, this building lifts up in the center and lifts up on the edges too. This facilitates breeze at the lower level, as well as what the courtyard naturally does in terms of breeze and ventilation. And then louvers have been added all around which are inclined, which you'll see later, which are inclined towards the north so that only north indirect light enters all these office spaces. So that's a floor plan. And these are the cross sections with the building twisting up and down as it goes up. That's a cafeteria, which opens out onto a water body in one corner. And this is the entry to the building. So rather than creating an entrance doorway 
the building in itself lifts up. So you just simply are allowed to walk through. It feels that there is no barrier to enter this building. The building opens up to allow people in. These are other angles of the building. So again, because of the way the building is twisted on its side, the building is never perceived the same way from any direction. So every time you look at this building, whether you're on the left or the right or the north or the south, you get a different dimension of the building. That's the cafeteria opening into the water body across. And on the other side, there is a gym that opens up to the outside. These are the louvers that are all directed towards the north. So this building has a 30% reduction in heat gain simply by the way it has been designed without using other things like double insulated glass, etc. So the design itself makes it sustainable. So very quickly, that's a drone shot from the top where you can see the building and a large amount of landscape space within. And these are some of the internal spaces. So at all times, when you walk through this office, you are allowed to look back into that courtyard space in some direction and every time your perspective changes. This is the courtyard school in Kodla, a small place in Karnataka, which we have just started construction of, and that's the site. So the site is part of a master plan that we've done where some of those buildings have already been constructed. And the yellow portion is where we had to design the school, which is a pretty irregular shape. It's got a playground towards the south and it's got a temple on the northwest. And this is the way we responded with the program. In a ground plus one building, the building kind of takes the shape of the plot. And then it's very fluid and the classrooms are all situated in such a way that each one is actually opening up towards the side into a courtyard. And again, all the classrooms get north light only within the entire school. And then because there is a large playground towards the south, there are large deep sheltered spaces like the cafeteria, which you see at the bottom, where people can hang out and look out towards uh, the playground or watch a match when it's going on. The auditorium takes the south corner so that there is no heat gain from the southern side. These are sections of the building and this is how you see the building when you enter. There's a huge ramp that takes up to, uh, to the first floor. So there are no staircases in this building. Very easily accessible and punctuated all through with these courtyards. So what you see from the top is these punctuated courtyards which are allowing light to enter from the left or the right into the classroom. So everything is indirect. So again, by the nature of design itself, the school will be a highly sustainable school in terms of energy efficiency and reduced heat gain. And the school is not going to be air conditioned. So that is very, very important in this case. This is the Prestige University, which is now three months away from completion. And this is how we started this. This is a project in Indore. So it's a 35 acre campus where we are now developing the entire campus, but the site, interestingly, was bought in parts by the client. Although we knew from day one that they are trying to get the rear portion, which has now been got, and even those buildings have started. But the current situation where we were given the site in the first place was only the yellow marked area, which is in the area of 27,000 square meters. And unlike most sites which have a road on one side, two sides or all four sides, this has a single entry point and that's the only point where you can enter and you see, suddenly see the whole site at a shot once you've entered. So when we looked at the program and the kind of building that they wanted to make, all the requirements necessitated an area of 400,000 square feet. That 400,000 square feet, when you translate into a clean cut block just to see just to study how much is the built volume, how much is the landscape volume. It amounts to a ground plus six building with a landscape space of 60%. But that is too high for a university which is gonna have 2000 students going up and down every day. So we said, let's spread the building so that there is no need for vertical circulation in terms of elevators and people can go easily up and down by staircases. But when you make it ground plus three, the landscape area reduces to 46%. And that is a flow plate of 90 by 80 meters. And we all know that light penetration is not possible beyond an eight meter depth. So how do you get natural light inside? 
So we said, okay, we can do a courtyard. So you'll get light from eight meters from within, eight meters from outside. So you get a 16 meter floor plate and the building expands still further. And now you're left with 39%. So we started with 66% landscape space, which is now down to 39%. This is just the maths of the project in terms of how much built area and how much open space there is. And then we said, instead of making a large courtyard, like I said before, that a large courtyard only allows one to perceive that entire space in one way, whether you're in classroom one or you're in classroom 10 or you're in the auditorium or you're in the cafeteria, that same pure rectangle is what you will see all the time. So instead of doing that, let's give a number of courtyards. You achieve the same thing. You give natural light, which is indirect, but at the same time, you create differences and you create moods, you create an identity and you characterize each part of the school. Because now when you're in the cafe, you're looking at a different courtyard. And if you're walking out from the auditorium, you're in a different courtyard. Or when you're in the classroom or the library, again, you're looking at a different courtyard. And then the circulation space is within. Rather than going straight line, which is the way most buildings are done, we said, let's take a cue from the organic cities, the way they were planned and create interesting pathways, which are organic. So they weave through the building rather than just going in a rectilinear format. And also because there was a future expansion to be done diagonally, we've started the entry from the center of the building and then it kind of moves towards the side and goes towards the back, giving access to the future expansion where there will be more classrooms built at a later stage. By doing all of this, as I said, the landscape just kept getting reduced and kept getting reduced. So finally what we did is, we tilted the building down at one corner and tilted the building up at the other corner, thereby increasing the landscape to 70%, which is more than what we started off in the very beginning, trying to do a ground plus six building. So in a ground plus three level building, we've created more landscape space than a ground plus six building. And the idea is that this whole orientation is stepped towards the north, is stepped down towards the north so that the entire terrace, which amounts to 80,000 square feet of space on a floor, is like an open auditorium for the 2,000 students that are going to be there eventually in the campus. So this becomes a very interesting community space. I thought 80,000 square feet was big until I just spoke to you today. <laughs> Where this building is, what, 8 million square feet. One building of 8 million square feet. And then on all four surrounding sides, we've used a terracotta jali, which reduces the heat gain from all the sides. So this is a built program. It's very, very different because you had to create spaces for multiple things in this building. And the interesting part is that it had to be flexible because this was the first building we made, the first building being made on this campus, the classrooms were to be put here first, and then the classrooms are gonna be moved to a building behind later on. So all the spaces needed to be flexible within this plan. So you can see based on the program, the volumes are all different all throughout. But then that adds to the interest because then every space becomes unique. And if you look at the sections, so these show you the translation of the open and the enclosed spaces, the spaces that are polyvalent, which keep changing throughout the building as you walk through. So it's a graphic on its own. So at any point of the building, the relationship from open to enclosed to semi-enclosed is completely different and thereby every place within this building gets a unique identity. So these are the floor plans as the building keeps stepping back and the topmost level and then the terrace. And these are cross sections showing how indirect light comes in through all these courtyard spaces. And that's the building as it was envisaged when we started. And this was the design that actually won us a competition between uh, four architects and we got the project. And this building is now almost complete. So these are images of the interior spaces and the interior volumes that constantly change as one is walking through, moving through this building. And that was taken a year ago when the entire structure was complete. And this is the current state. So the whole building has been screened. The internal spaces are almost finished. These are the screens. 
That's the entrance. These are some of the courtyards which are within it. And it's beautiful light penetration. So all of that that we dreamed about and all of that that we had planned. And prior to starting construction, we also did the SDA, the spatial daylight autonomy analysis on the building. And every part of the building gets natural light throughout the day. So this is the current state. So by the end of the year, this will be fully complete. This is a small video which I took a couple of months ago on the terrace. So that's just a little video which gives me a break from talking and you can see how this house is. So this was a plot which had roads on all four sides, but the south, the southern side had this major arterial road with a lot of traffic. So this house literally turns its back towards the road and is oriented towards the north with a large garden on the northern side for which is totally away from the busy arterial road that it actually fronts. So when you walk past or you drive past this building, you only see the series of volumes which are screened and this is the northern side. So this whole garden is got complete privacy, no sound pollution and that's on the society road side. So when we started, the client said that, you know, I, with the, I have actually paid more for this building to be on this main arterial road and you've turned the whole house around and turned it and faced the other way where the smaller houses of the society are. He said, yes, but then that is what is climatically responsive architecture. And finally, when the house was done, he told us that when you made the design and when you showed us the design, frankly speaking, we really did not understand it completely. And now when we live in the house, we realize the importance of what he did. And every space within this house, there's some echo coming. Every space within this house has a different feeling because there is this constant play of volumes. And there are three different volumes within this house that constantly change. This is a large central courtyard space, which is ventilated and naturally lit from the top. Opening into a living room, which is six meters high, the other rooms which are 4.2 meters high, and then there are interstitial volumes, which are four and a half meters high. So there's a lot of sectional play within the house all through. There are these small terraces that are punctuating the house everywhere. So what these screens do is they are on the south, east and western side. So they mitigate the heat gain. And then there are planters and balcony spaces within, which further mitigate the heat gain. And the house is literally about 10 to 12 degrees cooler than the outside when you walk. sheltered spaces that where you can sit out. That was towards the roadside. So even though it is an arterial road and you sit outside, nobody can look in into the house, whereas you can look out because you are close to the screen. So now those were the courtyard, the in more intimate spaces within buildings, which form the polyvalent spaces. And we now move to the community spaces, which are the larger scale polyvalent spaces. So this is the street. It's an 800 room student hostel that we completed in Mathura about three years ago. 
This was the existing campus. This campus is about 40 years old and all the existing buildings were like this. And when the client called us, uh, you know, we were showing the portfolio. He said, okay, okay, after 10 pages, he said, I've seen enough. You just tell me that, can I, can you give me drawings to start construction within a week's time? That was our brief. So he said, yes, we'll give you drawings to start within a week's time. And there was a very important reason for that because new students come and the new students were coming within seven or eight months at that time when he was speaking to us. So he said, you know, I don't really care about the design, but you give me something fast. That's all I want. I want fast construction, fast design. Contractors should not stop work. And that's it. So that was a brief. We looked at this campus. This is the campus. They've got these hostels, which literally face each other. Whether it's the engineering division or whether it's uh, the computer labs, every building is just simply placed like somebody did a mathematical thing, you know, building, 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 building. Okay, you want four more buildings? Okay, four more buildings. Three more buildings, three more buildings. So that's the campus and the way it looks. And that's our site, which is a trapezoidal shaped site. Now within the site, we explored options and we saw how can we do this. And of course, our mandate was to keep it only ground plus three because again, you don't want to rely on vertical circulation. And anyway, the rest of the institute also was only ground plus three. So looking at the requirement of 800 rooms, those are the kind of blocks that you get if you were to do something. And that was the kind of block if we were to repeat the kind of blocks that they had already existing on site. So rather than doing any of those, what we did is created these streets. So the buildings are actually moving from north to south and opening up towards the northern side, towards the playground side and forming very interesting streets. And when you explore options of how we could make all these rooms face the north, you would have had to give a balcony space to each. But then balcony spaces were not allowed because they said that uh, students jump out of balconies. So we were not allowed to give balcony. No, it's a fact. So and plus it becomes very uneconomical to do that because there's a lot of wastage of circulation space. So what we did is we kept the room straight, but we still turned the corridors within the buildings and created all these polyvalent spaces, which are, you know, breakout spaces in the middle, just like a street, a street goes and it opens into a little village square and then it village square and then it turns and then made bay windows, which are oriented towards the north. So every room gets a small little bay window, which opens to the north and then you got a uh, Within this entire campus, two gyms and two cafeterias, which are the central community spaces, which break the monotony of the hostel buildings, which are number five. So purposely one situated right in front of the playground and one situated at the back so that you have two main focal areas within the campus. And these are the way the windows are twisted. So the windows, because there were going to be so many number of windows, we decided to do a graphic with it and alternately twist them. And then to provide identity, give a little bit of color just within the jam of the building so that you can actually identify that yes, the yellow one is mine or the red one is mine. So identity is a very important aspect of architecture when one is doing things on a large scale. So these are cross sections and this is the final view when you're walking on the main arterial road, which is facing the playground. And these are the internal spaces. So and these are the shadows. So because it is in this north to south direction, in the morning you get shadows from this side, in the evening you get shadows from that side. So whatever time of the day it is, people are actually using these gardens, even though it is 40 degrees, because of the shade, you can still sit out in the open. And very interestingly, these spaces are actually being used the way we intended them to be used. and. A very nice thing said by a student here was that it's a very large campus that the students leave the rest of the campus every evening post their uh, the classes are over. They come only to this hostel part and the entire campus or that 50 acres is only hanging around in this hostel, even though they don't live there because this makes them feel good. These are the kind of spaces that are there within. The whole construction was done at a very low cost, it's 1600 rupees a square foot. The building with the interior was finished and it was finished in seven months. And because of the way the orientation is, an interesting aspect is that uh, the air conditioning units, the large units, ducting had been done because they wanted to create air conditioned hostels. 
the units had not come in and the hostels opened in the middle of summer when it's the hottest and they were expecting a lot of complaints but there was no student complaint and when they were asked they said that we actually don't need it because the rooms were naturally cool simply by the way the planning was done these are people sitting outside in the summer 33 degrees celsius at 2 o'clock in the afternoon and that's a view towards the playground where you can see all the windows oriented towards north towards the playground so those are the color differentiations which make a very interesting graphic when you're walking through and these are the way the bay windows are being used we just happen to pass this hostel room and see the students sitting here and working so this is a project called uh, the ras houses where we planned the whole 100 acre campus in a place called ras which is a 3 hour drive from jaipur city and very close to biawar in rajasthan and the site is literally in the middle of nowhere there is nothing that surrounds it there is no village there is no house there is nothing so it's a completely self sufficient site made for the people who work in the cement factory which is a new one which is put up right there so if you look at the entire site this got relatively flat contours at the front and high contours towards the rear and the public zone therefore has been kept towards the main entry road which is on the southern side and the more private residential zone is towards the rear so this is a google image and that was the original layout that was done and our entire queue literally has been from the way the cities were designed organically in the past every old city is so interesting when you look at it whether it's uh, the city of jodhpur or whether you go into the heart of jaipur city you go into old delhi you go internationally you go into the old cities of kotor and montenegro there are multiple cities like this venice all of these are organic they are interesting they have no street looks the same and that's the kind of character you want to bring within this complex and here there was a site difference of 16 meters and uh, the first call we got from the engineer on site was that you know while you are doing the design can we start leveling the site so we said please don't level the site i know we are only increasing our own work but we don't want any mud to go out or in other site so instead of doing five or six sections that have been normal we had to do about 160 sections but in doing that we saved the entire earth and there was no cutting or filling done on this site very minimal whatever little was cut was used there itself so all of it is planned on the existing contours so you entering at one level and you're walking in thinking it's a ground floor but by the time you reach towards the end you realize there's a floor below you so depending on the contours each part was individually designed and that's the overall layout where you can see the organic character of the entire structure so it's a mix of hostel rooms uh, bachelor's accommodation and a cafeteria gym a movie uh, theater and other common facilities so each part has a very interesting unique character within the entire complex and this is the way the levels change and the layouts change at every level and this is the way the units are planned so even the unit keep stepping back creating these open to the sky terraces and sheltered balcony spaces so these are sections some of the various section that we did showing how each part is completely different and planned accordingly so when you walk through the site or when you move through the site you can see that all of these are the natural contours and each of the buildings is oriented slightly differently so again although there is repetition in the number of units every unit that you go in whether it's the ground of the first or the second or number 12 or number 24 or number 36 each one is individual in identity at each time you have a different feeling of space the outside and the inside what you see is constantly changing the perception of volumes and the way it interacts with the landscape is again constantly changing at every point of this whole layout so these are images of the public spaces within which are shared and these are the hostel blocks and the studio apartments so these are the corridors the open corridors that run through we've used the colors which are traditionally used in rajasthan 
So at every point, uh, the corridor changes color at a bend. A red goes into orange, goes into yellow. And these picture windows are all framing the outside when you walk through. So you get very interesting compositions wherever you are. All of this has been done with fly ash bricks, shaded spaces to reduce the heat gain and make it more sustainable in terms of energy efficiency, recessed windows to reduce the sunlight glare. And the entire energy for the whole 100 acre campus comes from the residual energy of the cement plant. We had first decided that we need to use solar panels and then we realized that there is so much residual energy that you don't need solar panels because all the energy comes at no cost from the cement factory to this thing. There is a water reservoir within the 100 acre campus which has natural water all throughout the year. So we've deepened that and we've created a step well kind of arrangement on the sides making a community space. This portion is the last portion of the township which is getting complete now, almost done. So this is Ras houses, contextual and functional to its side. This is a project that uh, is in Rajasthan again in a small village called Noka, where the client here had an existing bungalow and uh, their father of the client passed away four years ago and they wanted to build something to commemorate his memory. So that's where they did the prayer and the puja when uh, he passed away. And we were given this site and said that now this is fixed, the Samadhi point. Now you got to build something around this and make it nice. And you want a small museum space which tells the life history of uh, what he did and what at what stage. And at the same time, you want to do something for the village children. So we suggested to make a small village library. And they also wanted that there should be some screen, you know, they did not want disturbance to their house. So the ideal way would have been to put some kind of a screen and orient all of it towards the right hand side. So rather than just putting a screen, what we've done is created this curved, interesting shape, which goes with the landscape and becomes an organic, natural, contoured, bermed space where you just see the grass growing over it and the building slowly emerges from the ground like this rising up to form the library and within the berm space underneath is the museum and the entire roof in itself also becomes usable as a garden space. So these were the initial block models that we made. Those are the floor plans. So it's a very small children's library. There's a space for the statue which was already decided upon. The steps that take you up to the garden and the brown space below is the museum space. So these are cross sections, those are the initial views and there are stone screens on the library space so that you reduce the heat gain and all of this is proposed to be built in natural stone which is now done and this is, so it's within this tiny building which is like literally only about eight or nine thousand square feet, you got a small museum, you got a children's library. You have this open courtyard space, which is oriented towards the north, which can be used as community services and the rooftop in itself is used as a garden space. So this is the current state. It's also about two months away from completion. It's all being built in natural stone. Those are all natural sandstone jallies which have been done. And this is the garden also, which got planted about two weeks ago. And this is a tiny, very badly taken video by an engineer on site. So, sorry for all the shaking. Which just gives you a glimpse of the current status. And these very interesting scoop skylights, which will give natural light to the museum from the top, within the earthworm. This building generated so much interest in the village that they realized that, that you will have to make space for a large cafeteria, for a kitchen, more parking spaces. So we've actually added a structure now towards the end. 
which facilitates all of that, plus large amount of uh, washrooms. That's the museum space. Sorry, it was very quick and very shaky, but so this is the children's library that is now almost complete in Nokha. And lastly, this is the extension spaces. The extension spaces again, all the time you're not gonna get a large site to be able to play with courtyards and create large community spaces. So sometimes it is only the extension spaces that you can do, which can help characterize and create these polyvalent spaces within the structure. So this is uh, one such case where that is where the school was, where which is already under construction and these are the hostels. So there's a guest house, studio apartments and a hostel, which are constructed like this, mostly oriented towards the north. And although these rooms are very small based on the client's requirement, because they don't want to build much, we said that at least give large, you know, balcony spaces so that each person has an individual open space of their own where they can step out and look towards the large playground which has been created. So that's quickly cross sections through the building and this is the way the building looks now. So all of these face the large playground that has been done and to, on the other end of the playground will be the school that is now under construction. And this is an old project, it is eight years old now. It's a tiny plot in Ranchi and that's the floor plan, a single apartment of floor, three bedroom, not very small, not very large, it's 1800 square feet. But we are talking only about the extension spaces. So this is one of the good examples of the extension spaces that we've done where every room, not every apartment, but every room of every apartment opens into a 24 feet high terrace space. And the reason we came up with this was that Ranchi as a city is landlocked by what is called Adivasi land. So there's very little real land left to develop. And like every other city, which is rapidly urbanizing here again, population has increased. People want to move out. They want larger houses or they want more houses and they cannot afford to buy plots for bungalows. And it's a city where everybody has lived only in villas or bungalows or row houses. So they're all down close to the ground and they're used to walking out in the open. And the reason why I'm saying this is because I've been going to Ranchi earlier. We did two hotels there. And I saw a number of residential buildings that looked like they were unoccupied for multiple years. So I said, why are all these buildings unoccupied? And in this case, the client actually told us that, you know, he showed us a site and he said, Ki, now you tell me what to do. I said, I am not going to tell you what to do. You tell me what you want to do and we'll do it in, for you in the best way possible. You know, so whether do you want to make a residential building, you want to make an office building, what, what is it you want to make? He said, no, you've been coming to Ranchi often enough. This is the plot. You know Ranchi. You tell me what to do. So we only told him that do one apartment of flow, but make an apartment in such a way that people feel the openness and they are, don't mind going into apartment because look at all these apartment buildings. They're all lying empty. Five years, six years after construction, they are lying empty because they all made it like a bomb building. Boxes with literally no balcony, if at all, one tiny balcony. And people are not used to it because they go from a villa and they go into this apartment and they feel boxed in. So here, every room opens into these 24 feet high balcony spaces. That's the living room. And each one of the bedrooms, the kitchen, every room opens into these spaces. And there are many people who thought that this was done for the purpose of pure elevation, but that's not the case. I'll explain you now why that balcony was done in this twisted way. So what happens is, how do you create a balcony and a terrace all in one? So by taking one side out at the bottom and the other side out at the top, what you do in terms of shadow is, there is a portion of your balcony which is open to the sky. 50% of your balcony is open to sky, 50% of it is sheltered. So you are given the choice that you, do you want to sit in the sheltered space or do you want to sit in the open space, depending on the weather or depending on your mood. So it's neither a balcony nor a terrace. We could not have stepped the building and created open terraces, which is what we would have loved to do as in other cases, because this plot was so small. And we didn't want to give balconies, which feel like balconies where people can just put a window outside and enclose it and make it part of the room. 
So it's purposely done in this way that gives you that flexibility. So you look at the guy on top, he can, that's the kind of thing it is. So that is why the opposite sides go out and that is why it was done that way. So that's Ishatpam. And this is the forest that we are starting construction now in Congo. That's the site. Amazing site in terms of the view. That's the Congo River. And uh, when you study it carefully, you see that the best views are only towards this direction, to the north. And that was our initial phasing and how we did it. Towards the rear of the site, which is the south of the site, there are residential towers of ground plus 15 already under construction. So, because that was already under construction, the entire service core, which is the dark black portion, is kept towards that side. And the complete orientation of all offices is towards the Congo River, so that every office gets this view. And at the same time, we don't want an office to overlook another office next to it. So, there is this whole L-shaped um, L-shaped kind of capsule that forms the terrace. And these are the cross sections where there are three levels of parking below. There are four levels of parking above. And the building will look like this when it's complete. There is a mix of single level offices, of two level offices, so that in plan as well as in sections, simultaneously the building is constantly changing. So you see one part of the building, I don't know if you can make out this on the left side, it gradually steps back also while it's going up and the other side gradually starts coming out. So at every point again, this building will look totally different depending upon where you see it from. But most importantly, every office gets a breathing space of their own where they can walk out into the balcony and enjoy the view of the Congo River at any time of the day. And very quickly, this is almost the end. I know, time's up. I've got a time's up. It'll just be two moments. So this is a house that we also constructed in Noka. It's completely built in natural sandstone from the region, from Jodhpur. This is a central atrium space, which is naturally ventilated. And these are all the external spaces. So these again are the extension spaces that are completely sheltered. And because of these sheltered spaces, the sheltered corridors, one has all these extensions all throughout the house, which allow people to walk out, sit out in the open weather, even when it's hot. In Rajasthan, everybody who knows the Rajasthan weather is, even if it's extremely hot outside in terms of temperature, if you're in the shade, you're okay. So that's the Rajasthan weather. So every room of this house opens out into these massive 20 feet, 18 feet, sheltered courtyard space, external courtyard spaces. This is a house that we completed last year in Bilwara on a very, very tiny plot. It's only 400 square meters. This is a floor plan. So you can see that it's really tight, it's very limited garden space. And here again, it's the extension spaces that the whole envelope created towards the north have these sheltered spaces within these arcades that give the house character, but most importantly, it gives external sit-out spaces to each portion and at the same time reduces the heat gain into the house from all directions. That's a sculpture in the corner by Radha Patel who's sitting here. And these are the internal spaces of this house. So at every point when you walk into this house, there's something interesting to look at, a focal point, a sheltered space and the whole external language is carried forward in the interior, which has been done by Nina. And these are the spaces which every room walks out into. So these were the projects which talk about polyvalent spaces. And like I said in the beginning of the presentation, it is these spaces that actually make the architecture what it is and what it can be. And uh, because a lot of people initially start by creating one box and then subdividing it based on the functional needs of the client. But it's not that, you have to open it up, you have to split it up, you have to create all these interesting polyvalent spaces that actually make the architecture. And these are the few projects that I showed you which were complete. But below that, for all those completed projects, there are literally four times the amount of projects that did not get complete, did not see the light of day, and probably will never see the light of day. So if everyone thinks that, okay, that's very easy, you know, you are getting clients like this, because I've been asked these things, 
you know, you get clients, it must be very easy for you to convince. No, it's not easy. It's never easy. At every point, you're fighting, you're convincing, and you're doing, it takes more time to convince a client than to actually design. And for all those designs that have been done, literally, I'm not joking, there are hundreds of projects that have remained on paper, remained in 3D, and will probably remain in 3D. Competitions that we won, which never materialized. I mean, not even, uh, you know, that it was just a pitch. This actual competition won that never seen the light of day, like that Amalsa temple, which is in the center at the bottom. It's a beautiful temple designed in the middle of our lake, but it's never going to see the light of day. So there are multiple projects like this. Thankfully, some of these now new projects are all getting complete and are under construction. We're doing this very interesting small museum and community center in Buldana, which is a tiny place in Maharashtra. And then there is this community center, which is already under construction. It's a community center, although it's a really tiny, tight plot, but that was the client's requirements. He did, he wanted to make a library, gym, game spaces, restaurant for the community in Akluj. And apparently in Akluj is very difficult to get land. So it's a really tiny plot and it's a vertical community center within that small plot. This is a project that we are doing, which is very eco-friendly. It's a 20 room boutique hotel in Mulshi Lake, which is near Lonavla for those of you who are from Bombay. So three hour drive from here, already under construction where we are using zero concrete. Everything is being built in wood, metal and laterite. And then that's a resort that we are about to start in Udaipur, which is a 250 room resort on a very highly contoured land. So based on the contours, we made, you know, hills, like across the hill, we made these communities where each one is about 50 rooms, 50 rooms and four clusters like that. And very simply designed, but the whole idea is that it just merges with the landscape of the location. And there is a natural water stream that is flowing through the site which you're going to expand and make into a lake that is within the site. This is a project that is now under construction in Ranchi, where again, there is a single apartment of floor and they all open into these massive single or double height terraces all through. And that's how we're starting construction in Goa, which again is a 45 degree slope site. So the whole house responds to the site in a way. Again, here there is a natural stream on the right hand side. So the house is literally cantilevered over that stream and stepping back based on the contours with every terrace overlooking the sea, clear 180 degrees view of the sea. That's a school which is under construction. I mean, that was the original uh, image of the foundation, but now it's three floors up. And this school again is a fully non-air conditioned school. It's got a large courtyard space and all the ventilation is indirect all throughout the school. That's a 200 room resort that we have started construction in Jaisalmer, which again is spread out in this very interesting way, taking inspiration from the sand dunes of Jaisalmer. And that's the school, which is for the same client for who we're building the garden libraries. And once the garden library is over, we are starting this school, which again is 100% naturally ventilated, naturally lit school, going to be built in uh, adobe construction with courtyards and open and sheltered spaces. So at the end, it's about context, being contextual to the climate, functional aspects, the client's requirements, but most importantly, exploring and experimenting always and finding a solution in a way that has not been done before. Because that is why we become architects. No, we are one of the lucky professionals who can get to do something different every day of our lives. So why don't we do it? So I leave you with that thought and the thought that one of my professors in the first year told me, think before you draw that line, because every line that you draw is going to mean something to somebody for 50 years minimum. Please think before you draw that line. Don't just make it. Thank you.